What brings a community together? Shared insights? Shared conversations? Welcome to Open Door by Cox Communities, tackling the big questions on the minds of smart community business leaders. Welcome back to Open Door by Cox Communities, where we're providing information for you to consider when making decisions for your multifamily communities. Discover the latest trends and technologies that are making some multifamily business owners stand out. I'm your host, Bess Friedman, CEO of Brown Harris Stevens. Today, we're discussing best practices in planned communities regarding sustainability, creating that sense of community, and the importance of technology. I'm very pleased to be joined right now for the discussion by the CFO of the Eagle Group, Neil Payne, and the VP of Marketing at Cox Communications, Suzanne Schlein. Neil and Suzanne, welcome to the show. Okay, well, good afternoon. I would like to begin our conversation today by taking a moment to introduce the both of you to our audience. So beginning with you, Neil, tell us a little bit about your role and the work that the Eagle Group is focused on. Yeah, thanks so much, Bess. It's great to be with you guys today. And so I'm Neil Payne. I am the uh, CFO or the bean counter, as they all like to call me and poke me, of the Eagle Group, which is a real estate development and investment group. We have quite a wide portfolio. We do some residential developments and master plan communities, principally in Pensacola, Florida. We're doing a 2,700-acre community there. We're actually excited to team with Cox on that one. We have a five-star resort development down on the island of St. Kitts that we do. Cox doesn't quite get down there yet <laughs> anyway, Suzanne. Too bad for Cox. We'll, we'll you work know. that out. But And then we actually have some mining properties in the Western U.S. that my business partner picked up through a couple of really interesting deals. And some of them focused on the sustainable supply chain and, and critical minerals that enable EV battery technologies and things like that. So that's who we are at the Uber. Wow. Very cool. Well, Neil, before making the move into real estate, you spent a number of years working in the telecommunications and broadband industries. How did your time working in that industry influence the way that you approach your work today? It's kind of taking off now, but real estate and property technology or prop tech, are they're kind of a bit behind in the technology sense. And they're catching up rapidly in some areas, but definitely not all. So the perspective I bring, sometimes I learned in in technology and through time that I spent actually at Cox itself, most of what I learned was about the the blurring of the line between technology and people. And and technology is really a hero when it's out of the way, when people don't recognize it. And it just makes life and connections easier. So uh, I learned a lot about that. And I learned they have a unique discipline in technology that real estate can learn from about trend spotting and looking for secondary impacts and the discipline of that. It's funny, I was talking to somebody the other day about how I was sitting in a future session years ago in a telecom context talking about self-driving cars and how that would lead to a boom in car washes. Well, look around now. I mean, there's a car wash going in on every corner I drive by these days. And one of our neighbors just sold a portfolio of them for $900 million. So uh, so I should have paid attention to that future <laughs> session, but that, that's a discipline and a practice that I learned from my time in, in telecom and technology that applies to this world. Wow, that's incredible. Well, switching to you, Suzanne, you have over a decade of experience at Cox. And before that, you had a really amazing career at some important companies. Tell us a little bit about the work right now that you and your team are doing. Well, I lead the Cox Communities marketing team, and we're really the storytellers for the Cox Communities organization. We amplify the voice of our trusted advisors in the multifamily and new build technology space. And we offer a complete portfolio of of solutions specifically for builders, developers, and property managers. And I have offered to do a site visit the next time Neil heads to his island property, by the way. Please, come on. You're more than welcome. (laughs) I think I should go there, too, to do the (laughs) podcast from there. That's what I think. I think you should. Well, as I mentioned, Suzanne, you have had an amazing career at some awesome companies like Mattel, but you also spent several years at the Walt Disney Company, where among other things, you managed P&Ls. Tell us a little bit about your journey 
from Disney to Cox. Well, it doesn't really sound like a natural progression, does it? But, you know, both Mattel and Disney are global leaders with best-in-class innovative products and marketing teams. And Cox also offers best-in-class products, but, you know, more than products, innovative technology solutions and best-in-class marketing. And, you know, one thing that really stuck with me from my days at Disney was that words matter. For example, at Disney, all non-employees are called guests. It's very intentional. So guests at the park, guests in the office buildings. And you might say, you know, what's the difference? Who cares? But if you really think about it, when a guest walks into your home, you treat them differently, right? You typically offer them a drink and warm hospitality. So, you know, the word, word customer just is very cold. And, you know, yes. similarly, the word tenant is very transactional. It's very cold. Resident implies more of a connection. And, and we all know that great communities create connections. So your company's culture should include a, a common vocabulary that's very intentional and that employees understand. And one word that we use quite a bit that my current organization is frictionless. We want customer experiences yeah. to be easy. And we understand that at leasing agents and property staff do not want to be the resident's IT support. So we want that to be frictionless. <laughs> I love that. I love that the way you, you broke that down. It's true. It does feel very transactional when you say tenant and, you know, it just creates this sort of space versus how you explain that it creates this relational <laughs> feeling. And that makes such a difference for people. So very nicely said. Something that we talk a lot about on this podcast is planning for the future when it comes to new construction. And one of the many factors that must be considered is sustainability. So, Neil, as someone intimately involved in the planning of large community projects, why is it so important to take the future sustainability of any community seriously? From my perspective, the real estate investment and, and the ESG community is maturing very quickly, but also grappling with that question and where we fall collectively on the spectrum of just doing the right thing because we're supposed to versus being a true business or moral imperative and, and all the way in between. And, and it means so many different things in so many different places. And in some places, it's, it's literally an environmental sort of capital E environmental imperative. You must do this. In other places, it's legislated best where you are, local law 97. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we don't have that one in Pensacola, but <laughs> we uh, it's legislated there. In some places, it's just the right thing to do. But, you know, on the island in St. Kitts, for instance, we have to have our floor level for a beachfront resort at 13 feet above sea level. That's a lot of sand we have to bring in, wow. but our insurance requires it. And so it's both a, an imperative from a environmental sense as well as a financial sense. And water and power, we have to have full backup systems. And so we have to take that opportunity to respond and make those things sustainable. But it's all trade-offs, right? I mean, as, as the CFO, I'm the bean counter and, and I have to do deal structures that account for both ESG imperatives and our financial obligations to our limited partners. And uh, it's, it's interesting, in 2009, I founded a company in Nicaragua in a, in a prior life that was a fair trade company. And we applied to be a B corporation or a benefit corporation. And you know, when we applied to that, they asked things like, do you recycle? And do you have automatic timers on your light switches? And these things that were for lack of a better word, trivial at the time. And ESG is going through some of that kind of maturation cycle. Investors back then had no idea how to underwrite a benefit corporation. And ESG is more sophisticated and the criteria is clearer today. But in the deals that we do, we have to work really hard to make sure that the ESG and the sustainable investments that inherently are almost always more expensive, that, that there is a business rationale for it. Are they going to drive absorption? Will they help lease up? Will they decrease OPEX? Will we get a lower cap rate when we sell? You know, back in those, in 2009, in those benefit corporation days, we talked about a true double bottom line. And ESG kind of has that question now. Both bottom lines have to be real and neither can apologize for the other. So as we're balancing, as, as the developer, we balance sort of interest rates and inflation climates and all that just has to be really well thought out in your deal structures to make sure you've got horizons and objectives that are aligned throughout. Yeah, and you're ensuring also the future, safety of the future with all these things that need to be in place. It's very like, you know, that's a great way to put Absolutely. your roadmap, right? That's, that's so smart to do it that way. It's not short-sighted. It's like taking the long view. 
Yeah, we we have friends to to your point, Bess. We have friends and colleagues. We don't do high rise in New York, but but we have friends who, when they do and they think about pursuing an exit, their investors may not necessarily be ESG motivated. But if they're targeting an exit to a pension fund or to a family office or to whoever they're targeting the exit to, who is looking at a longer term hold, like a twenty plus year hold, they are going to have a different set of criteria when it comes to those sustainability investments because their horizon is truly the long term. So you got to think about it from both ways. So sustainability can mean different things in different places as you just touched on. But what can you tell us about the different types of things that must be considered depending on location? Now you just brought up seeing kids in the in the thirteen feet. I get that. Yeah. Give us some other examples of that. In Florida, in the Panhandle, for instance, sustainability is power is abundant. It is reliable. We have the benefit of sitting on an amazing aquifer there. And so a lot of what we think about there is sort of hurricane resilience focused. And so as the hurricanes ran through, I, th- I believe it was Fiona that ran through Florida and, and did so much damage. There was a an example of a community called Babcock Ranch that used a special financing instrument called a community development district to invest in their own solar generation and essentially create their own microgrid. And while everybody else's lights were off, theirs were on. And this created a whole new level of awareness back to kind of the point that they had a financing structure that was aligned with those sustainability imperatives. And as a result, their lights stayed on. And so that's a lot of what we think about in that context. I love it. It's so important. I think this sort of turns a light on for so many people to pay attention to, you know, otherwise you get stuck. Like what happened in, in Texas and, you that's know, right. like you can't, I mean, that's real. Those are real challenges and issues and impact lives. And so mm-hmm. it's great that you guys are doing this. When it comes to environmental and sustainability concerns, there can be at times some space between what is actually required by law and what may just be the right thing to do. And I know that Cox takes this idea very seriously. Suzanne, I would love for you to take a moment to talk a little bit about some of the conservation and sustainability goals that Cox has set for the future and achieved in the past. I could talk about this for hours, but I'll I'll keep it to a few minutes. Cox has very ambitious goals for sustainability, but they really stem from our why. And if you've heard of the best-selling author and motivational speaker, Simon Sinek, and I'm sure you have or seen one of his TED Talks, You might remember that knowing your why is absolutely critical in inspiring others to action. It's that whole idea that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So our mission is to connect our customers to the people and things that they care about most. But our company's why, our our real reason for being as a company, is to empower people today to build a better future for the next generation. And, you know, some people might say, oh, that sounds so, so aspirational, you can't possibly live up to it. Our owners really walk the talk and our conservation goals are zero waste to landfill by 2024. When I was thinking about that, that's right around the corner. We're in late February right now. And we've also accelerated our goals to be both water and carbon neutral by 2034. And the original goal was was actually 10 years later. So pulling it in by a decade is, is pretty aggressive. And we've invested in a lot of areas. One example is eco friendly packaging. And so as a marketer, of course, I love crisp white packaging with four color printing because it's eye catching and it's pretty. But, you know, brown boxes made with recycled content and the molded pulp trays that look like the drink carriers, you know, brochures made from 100 percent post consumer waste material. Those things are important for the environment and, and they're important to our customers. So we're doing that. We also we have solar arrays on buildings like a lot of companies do and a lot of businesses. But we also have floating solar at one of our Mannheim auto auction locations. I didn't even know that was a thing. I saw a picture of it. And there's this, I believe it's a man-made lake, but there's floating solar panels in it. Another thing that Cox Enterprises has done is invested in controlled environment agriculture. So all that indoor agriculture and vertical farming, and it uses 80% less water, produces 10 times the crop yield than traditional farms. So all of this to say, you know, we recently had a customer in for an executive briefing where we talked about primarily our technology business, but we brought in our VP of sustainability for the first time to you know, be on the agenda. We, we honestly weren't sure how that was going to go over. And Jaws were on the floor. They wanted to hear more and more about what we were doing in the space and what they could potentially do. So 
I think sustainable business strategy and that triple bottom line model, which is profit, people, and planet, is really gaining more and more traction. Profit, people, and planet. That's such a good way. That's wow. I'm learning so much from this discussion with both of you. Really, it's well, like so many other things, the cost of energy continues to rise. And I know that there are many innovative technologies being deployed to take on this challenge. What are some of the most exciting and innovative ways you both have seen energy concerns being met in new development? Appreciate this question. One, I get to have a couple of different seats at the table too. And, and one, of the, one of my responsibilities within our portfolio, I actually lead our brokerage business in St. Kitts under the Sotheby's International Realty brand for, for St. Kitts and Nevis. And this is the one our customers ask us about the most, our, our guests, sorry, Suzanne, guests is what I should call them. I love that. I'm going to implement that with our team for sure. That's a great one. So, so our guests ask us about this the most. And it's one thing in Florida or in Pensacola where we're at, you know, just over 14 cents a kilowatt hour, but power in St. Kitts is 49 cents a kilowatt hour, which is sort of mind blowing for most wow. people in our space. And not only that, you know, we look at inflation of 10 to 15 percent in the U.S. and energy costs, and, and that's a lot. I don't mean to trivialize that, but St. Kitts power has historically been provided by diesel generators, and diesel was up 26 percent last year. So that's a lot of pressure on those. Yes. And, and you know, what do they say? Necessity is the mother of invention. And so what we're seeing is a lot of emphasis on innovating around that. Not just for St. Kitts, but if you look at groups that participate in the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and small island states and that, there's a lot of emphasis on it. In St. Kitts, for example, there's a renewed push by the government there to focus on geothermal on the island of Nevis. Now, Nevis, for those of you that don't know, is an island that's your kid would draw my, you know, I have three small children under the age of seven. And if you ask them to draw an island, they would draw Nevis without knowing it. It's a volcanic shaped island in, in the middle of the Caribbean. And that being the case, there is immense geothermal capability on the island of Nevis as you think about the, the heat exchange in that environment. And so they're building a 10 megawatt geothermal plant, which will provide all of the power that the island needs slash energy costs from that 49 cents a kilowatt hour. And you think about the topic or the buzzword of being energy independent as a nation, that means one thing for us here in the United States. When you're a small island state and actually the smallest sovereign country in the Western Hemisphere, that's a really, really big deal. So, so that's a cool one. And there's also a lot of exciting stuff in hydrogen fuel cells. We have a partner who is working with a technology that with a hydrogen fuel cell the size of a railroad boxcar, he can power 150 homes. That's really exciting to us. And as the hydrogen supply chain catches up, think about where that can go. And then the final one that we watch ourselves uh, is the evolution of battery technology. I mentioned we have some mining businesses and one of them is a floor spar mine. So if I pulled the audience, I'm pretty sure three people would have heard of floor spar. But floor spar is a critical mineral that's actually one of the key ingredients in a lithium ion battery. There's about five non-lithium ingredients and floor spar is one of them. Last year, we started production at what is now the, the U.S.'s only operating floor spar mine. And now there's research that fluoride ion batteries might actually be twice as efficient and longer lasting than lithium ion batteries. So we're, we're watching that one closely and hoping we hit on black with that one. Wow. That's stuff. That's incredible stuff you're doing. And, and Suzanne, I just want to give you also an opportunity to answer the same question. Well, we, we talk about it a lot, but property management IoT is just exploding. Right. Uh, there are so many players in this space. And if you were at Optech this past year, there were IoT booths everywhere. But in addition to reducing operational costs by installing things like smart locks to eliminate the need for rekeying, for example, IoT can be a really powerful tool to help with energy reduction. So obviously smart lighting, which enables property managers to turn off lights, you know, on and off when only when tours are being conducted, that's one. But we're hearing that so many of our customers in places like Arizona and Las Vegas, which are like walking on the sun in the summer, right? They appreciate smart thermostats and the ability to remotely control them when no one's touring a unit. You turn down the air and if someone's coming 15 minutes before, I mean, this is really acting, your phone can act like a remote control for the property. Press the button, cool it down 20 minutes before. And, you know, of course, in, in cold areas, you can do that with heat. So it really does help with the energy management. I think those are great things they do that we have, you know, in New York, same thing in the city. A lot of people have that controls. They turn the air on and you control it. And it's such an advantage to be able to do that. So there's 
we're not wasting any, you know, waste yeah. not what not, you know, it's that whole mindset and we have to become a better planet in those regards. So, okay. In addition to energy, a major concern is always water. Neil, what are some of the challenges the Eagle Group has faced when it comes to this all important resource and what solutions have you deployed at your development? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mentioned earlier, and it is, it's such a blessing of abundance to sit on top of the Floridian Aquifer in the Panhandle. So we are very blessed by that, where the controversy is whether or not water should be bottled in the county or not out of abundance. And so that's a phenomenal situation in Florida, but in the islands, it's, that's not the story. I have the honor of being able to be on the board of a nonprofit called Siembra Vida in Western Puerto Rico, and they run a fully off-grid farm and farm-to-table fine dining restaurant that runs a lot of community and discipleship programs and things like this. But they went off-grid as an imperative. They had to, right? It wasn't an option. And so what they, they did, they're small, but they built about a 6,000-gallon catchment system that captures 40,000 gallons a year. They filter it five times, and then they use it in a five-star you know, fine dining restaurant that's one of the top rated in Western Puerto Rico. Wow. Uh, and as a result, when hurricanes come through, you know, when Maria went through in 17 and Fiona last year, they actually had excess water that they were able to offer out to their communities. So not only is it sustainable in that sense, but it, but it's also a community benefiting program. So it checks the E and the S and the ESG. But in St. Kitts, it's a totally different scale and a, and a different rationale. Building a five-star resort there, we actually, our code requires us to keep a 10-day supply of backup water on hand. And so our engineers right now are working through the process of designing the cistern systems and, and the desalinization plants and, and all that. One of the systems actually, our GC was just talking to me about it this morning, was he's looking at a reverse osmosis desalinization system that is fully photovoltaic. So that's the biggest mouthful I can come up with as a CFO. <laughs> that's too many words for me, not enough numbers. But the system, it's a filtration system that is entirely powered by solar without a battery. So this is kind of what's unique and is pretty cool. And the statement is that it is designed to store energy in the water. And as I said, okay, well, what does that mean? It's, it's a little clever, but it's designed to pump only when there's sunshine and then release the water at night. And that might not work in Seattle, but in St. Kitts, we have 97% sunshine. So that's pretty great. That St. Kitts is, you know, that sounds like paradise, really. We have fun. Perhaps one of the most important things to consider when planning any residential project is ensuring that a true sense of community is able to thrive and grow there. Suzanne, why is this such an important thing for developers to consider? Well, you know, earlier we talked about how words matter. And here, here's another example. Apartment buildings are different than apartment homes or communities. An apartment building might provide you a perfectly adequate place to live and lay your head at night. But an apartment community makes it feel like home. It becomes a neighborhood with its own vibe, you know, filled with residents, maybe their pets, staff that live and work there. And, you know, they're the friends you make from Unit 3B and meet up with at the pool or the clubhouse. Or, you know, one of the friendly community managers who makes sure that the building in your unit is maintained. So, you know, the community is, is the reason that a resident is glad they rented or, you know, in some cases bought there instead of somewhere else. So apartment communities really need to live up to that designation. It's also, you know, like the services, what you provide. That's why when this whole thing during the pandemic was going on and people were talking about how, you know, there would be buying online, like people would buy their homes online and do that or even in buildings. The truth is that when you're investing in a place where you may potentially raise kids or where you first get married or whatever, you're going to need to see the environment for the most part, unless you're an investor where it's more transactional, but where you're living and having dinners and doing all those things, people want to feel it out. They want to see what it's like, what it looks like, how the people are. That matters so greatly because it's an emotional commodity. You know, it's not a stock portfolio. It's where you live and it's such sacred space. So I think that's such a good point, Suzanne. And what would you say are some of the most important, the most innovative or successful things that you have observed in these sort of communities. You mentioned that the COVID pandemic changed so many aspects of our lives. And, you know, for many, life has returned back to pre-pandemic habits. But our research is telling us that, yeah, people are holding on to the good parts of COVID. And that includes hybrid life. So the flexible work schedules. But as these hybrid work schedules are here to stay for many, people have gotten tired of living and working in their apartments. It's hard to be in the same four walls all day long, right? 
And they also might have lost that sense of work community to a certain extent, going out, you know, for lunch with people, et cetera. So certainly thoughtfully designed co-working spaces where people can connect with their work from home neighbors. Another thing I, I recently heard about, and it's probably a lot more rare, but some properties are modifying amenities like restriping their tennis courts for pickleball because it's become so popular and you know, the number one growing sport in the country. And it's such a social sport. And I don't know if either of you have tried it, but it is really fun. And I've, I've heard, heard it noisy, though. I've heard it's very like they did that in the parts of the Hamptons. And there's a lot of people complaining about it because it makes a ton of noise. Apparently. It makes noise just from the from playing it. Also, the people, it's not like tennis, which is quiet. You know, people don't typically talk while they're playing. It's very social. And one of the shots in pickleball is a dink. It's just a little shot. So I recently learned of one community that had a series of dinks and drinks, which was basically pickleball socials with cocktails. Nice. So I, I, I loved that. I think we can all agree that pet parents tend to be a little fanatical. I know I am about my two dogs. I mean, more than 23 million households adopted a pet during the pandemic. So yeah. wow. dog parks, dog washing stations are very popular and help residents meet those with similar interests. But even if a property doesn't have on-site pet amenities, they can still host Yappy hours where they're passing out dog treats, followed by a community pack walk. I think it was Steve Leftwitz on an earlier podcast that mentioned a really creative community building initiative that one property had, and they invited people to share their artwork. And so they posted it in the common spaces and the hallways. Love that. And then in terms of events, um, I think one of the best practices that I've been seeing is that a, a less emphasis on grab and go. There used to be, you know, a gourmet coffee truck would show up, but that doesn't really encourage people to to stay and stick around. So, you know, throw a, a Super Bowl party with a big screen TV as a grand prize, but you have to be present to win. So people hang out. Yeah. And I can tell you one of the most successful events that we did in conjunction with a, with a property, and this was a while ago, was actually when we were first launching our residential gigabit speeds. But we, we it was around the holidays and we offered speed gift wrapping because you know, we're clever as marketers like that. It was all about speed. And we offered, if you think about it, how many people like wrapping presents? I mean, I hate it. There was actually a survey in 2021 that I think it was 2,000 Americans identified the very worst part of the holiday season was wrapping gifts. So we had free gift wrapping, we had cookie decorating, pet photos, and people loved it. So I think there's, there's just so many great ways to create community and all of the community building and help a property attract residents and also reduce turnover. And ultimately, that's what many are interested in. Yeah, I mean, that's culture building, too. And I agree with you, like when people were working from home, you know, it's so it's it comes like the same monotony and then you don't have division if you have kids. And so I think it's really nice to offer those like co-working places in those environments so people can go and work. And then you have separation when you're home. You can like do other things besides, you know, I think you don't draw the line sometimes yeah, uh -huh. if you're working at home. And so I love that you have all the, I love the happy hour. I mean, yes. that's, so, I'm going to have to copy that. That's so cute. Um, so Neil, I know that the Eagle Group is really focused on ensuring that the developments are environments where people can thrive. Tell us a little bit about your approach and the steps you are taking to achieve that. It's interesting from my background as a, you can call it that, as a fair trade entrepreneur, I, I often kind of feel like people underemphasize the S in ESG, right? For us at Eagle, that is probably the biggest one and the most important one is, is we find the responsibility. And as I listen to Suzanne talk, I hear so much inspiration in her thoughtfulness of how she curates those communities. And we find that to be a very important responsibility to create communities where people can thrive and thoughtful work where redesigning experiences that aren't typically social experiences like pickleball to Suzanne's point, but we think about the mailbox. So again, necessity is the mother of, of innovation or invention. In Florida, there's a requirement in our area that mailboxes are co-located, that we do mail kiosks. And so there are no, the postal service will no longer service mailboxes at individual residences, which on the one hand, if you just, you know, sort of chuck up a mailbox kiosk, that can be a bit of a bummer and a nuisance. But what we're thinking about actually is how do we turn that into a social experience where people can meet their neighbors and going to get the mail is not dreaded or annoying. It's actually fun. And so we're looking, we're actually evaluating the concept right now of, of putting a coffee shop and potentially a little bakery right next to the mailbox kiosk so that 
people have a place literally when they strike up a conversation, go get a coffee or a wine or a whatever you might want. So we think that people were designed to live in community and we take that responsibility pretty seriously. And it's both with your friends as well as with your your family and inter- intergenerationally. Having been someone who has lived abroad, has I spent 10 years in Atlanta, but both my wife and I are from Virginia. And during COVID, like so many other people, we moved to be back closer to family. Uh, and it's just hard to find communities where we can all be together. And so at Eagle, that's a f- big focus for us. So our community in Pensacola, which we call Jubilee, it's 2,700 acres of mixed use, and we want to create a community where people just feel different from the minute they get out of the car. My partner actually calls it a community of light, and we want to create this environment where people can feel encouraged and welcomed and rejuvenated, and even if they're polar opposite. And, and demographically, the county is growing like wildfire where we're developing, but the growth is at the opposite ends of the spectrum. It's 35 and under and 65 and over. Uh, and so on the one hand, that might be ha- a hard needle to thread, but it's actually not as we study it. People in those age groups want the same thing. They don't want to get in their car. They want to be able to walk to restaurants and parks and activities. They want to meet their neighbors. And then importantly for our business model, they need thriving and and good health care. And so we've partnered with a a local hospital system and we're designing a medical campus walkable in the center of, of Jubilee. And we intend to radiate out world-changing telemedicine. And and by the way, we hope Suzanne and the team will help with that. So there's a shameless plug for help. (laughs) But but it's funny, yesterday I was I was in Nashville yesterday meeting with a medical REIT partner, and I actually pulled up an old telecom cable labs video called The Near Future. I don't know if you guys are familiar with or have seen this, but it's it's really inspiring. It set out to envision what telemedicine and remote monitoring could do three to five years into the future. Well, the fact of the matter is that was made three to five years ago. And so that's all here now. And you look at it and I don't know, maybe we could give ourselves an 80% score of of accuracy of what actually has materialized, but it's really inspiring. And and we're inspired to bring all that to bear at the center of Jubilee so that across generations and across people types and groups and interests, there is something for everybody and they're all knit together into a community where where everybody is abiding by the spirit of that community of light principle, right? Where our uh, marketing group who's more articulate than I am likes to say the, the modern day version of borrowing a cup of sugar is getting your neighbor's Amazon packages. And so that's the gold <laughs> standard for us is that we want neighbors who get each other's Amazon packages. I love that. I mean, that it's about connection, right? It sounds like you're really like connecting people with each other and and the things that they need, the services that they need, whether it be healthcare, whatever it is. And that's what makes that's what makes us human. You know, we don't want to be isolated in a corner doing our own thing. We want to be connected to each other. Not all the time. Obviously, we all need a little moment for ourselves. I know I do with two children. But you know, it's good to have that to have people that are looking out for you that see you. And I think that's so well put. I love that. What What is it called again? No, it's a community of light. Community that- of light. Yep. You can just hear the angels singing. And I, you know, when you were talking about <laughs> the getting your mail, I, we have a, a kiosk and it is a pain in the neck and it's not even far away. It's like right across the street. But I go once a week with a bag to go get yeah. the mail. If I had a bakery where I could get a cookie every afternoon, it's like, oh, like neighbor, <laughs> meet me at three o'clock after the guy comes. And you know, I'm, we're all there. I love that. Such a good idea, Neil. I love that because that would get people. It's like the water cooler thing at the office. It's like you go to get your mail. You know, you got bills and things in there, but you see your neighbor, you get a chocolate chip cookie, which we all love, and you get to chat and talk to somebody. And it's like a it's a nice way to sort of make something maybe tedious feel good. Yeah, like, I think that's so it's so great. Um, I can okay, take no rambling. credit. We've got good land planners. Yeah, what? I see that. And good ideas. Okay, so. Ensuring that families can thrive as well is also paramount when it comes to building a community. Suzanne, I would love for you to take a moment here and tell us a little bit about some of the exciting ways that Cox is using its technology to help builders and developers ensure their projects meet all the challenges that we discussed today. We do a ton of consumer research. I think Neil alluded to the fact that he used to sit into a lot of these future forward meetings as well. But what we hear from residents is is very consistent. They want the same thing. You know, and when you're moving into a place, no gap in service. They're, that is a non-starter. They want to stream video and music while unpacking. They want to be able to get onto their laptops that night and get work done. So no gap in service. 
The second is instant online activation. They do not want to spend time on the phone scheduling service. In fact, you know, many younger people and older people that just don't want to talk on the phone ever, right? And they don't want to wait for installers. And then the third, they, they just want the best internet experience. Most people really don't care about what the technology is. They just want it to work. And we hear that over and over again. So our answer is pre-installed internet. It adds value to residents by having the services up and running the day they move in. And we can deliver it with our quick connect experience or bulk internet solutions. And yet we were also talking earlier about IoT solutions that, you know, they support owners in managing their properties. They can enable contactless prospect tours and they provide smart home convenience to the residents. So, you know, those are some of the things we do. Unlike a lot of other IoT companies, we have the end to end solution, you know, it's one hand to shake is what we like to say. Not easy, but important. Well, before we wrap up today, I would like to give each of you an opportunity to leave us with any sort of closing thoughts, things that you think are important. Or one thing you'd like the audience to remember about what we discussed today, and I'm going to go to you, Neil. To me, the most important thing to understand is it takes a village, and and everybody needs to understand their role in this and the critical view that they have. We sat with this group earlier this week who was demonstrating an, an AI machine learning technology for a specific site selection that just absolutely blew our minds. And it reminded me of the importance of specialization, right? Which is, you know, maybe that's a nerdy economic concept, but, you know, when we're looking at stubbornly high inflation and high interest rates and pressured housing prices, you know, climate change isn't slowing down in the face of all those things. And so we, as a developer, we need partners in the technology space to push the envelope on what's possible for sustainable technologies and making those things I love the word Suzanne used, uh, frictionless uh, earlier, to make them frictionless and just make sense both from that triple bottom line perspective. I love that too, right? People plan it, profit, and whether we're making a resort or, or a residential community for something to be deployed, we have to we have to have a check all three of those boxes. So we need partners who do that in the ecosystem. And then as developers and architects and engineers and real estate investors, we have to challenge ourselves too to stay current and, and push the envelope on technology that's really changing faster than the typical subdivision plat allows. I think that that pace of change in technology is often different than the pace of change in real estate. And it's our challenge on the real estate side to make sure that we are, are pushing ourselves to keep up. So important. You have to. Otherwise, like you said, you're not planning for the future. You want to make sure these buildings are equipped for all the things that they will need, you know, if something happens, you know, so it's it's really important. Well, Suzanne, I'd like to give you an opportunity, anything, final thoughts or anything you'd like to leave the audience with before we say goodbye to each other and meet in St. Kitts. Exactly. I'm starting to pack after this, right? Well, the, I would just say that, you know, the right technology experience can attract and retain residents. And the right technology from the right technology partner can allow property staff to focus on their jobs and support this mission of creating community. And, you know, at the end of the day, when residents feel a sense of community, you've given them yet another reason to renew that lease and minimize turnover. Oh, such a good point. You guys have been such great guests. I can't thank you enough. This has been so interesting. I had to take a few little notes from things that you said. I learned so much from this today. So. Suzanne, Neil, thank you so much for the time today and enlightening all of us. And I'll see you guys soon. Take care of yourselves. Thanks so much. Kid. Great to be with y'all. <laughs> Thanks again to Neil and Suzanne for being on the show today and discussing best practices and planned communities regarding sustainability and creating that sense of community and the importance of technology. You can learn more about the amazing work that The Eagle Group is doing on their website, theeaglegroup.com. And don't forget, if you enjoyed the show, please rate us and leave a review. Thanks again for listening. I'm Bess Friedman, and this has been Open Door, brought to you by Cox Communities. Cox Communities.